It's from the highest category of quality on Dr. Sibley's charge sheet. Uh, and it's the, it's the category that you hear the most about. This will be Mulford Q. Sibley's free speech. Thank you very much. And I should like to thank Dr. Brantner for preparing the way. Uh, I feel that he was, in a sense, laying the groundwork for what I can, can say very inadequately, very inadequately at best. Is this working? <laughs> Last year, in the spring, while I was conferring with a student, my telephone rang and a voice at the other end said in an excited tone, can you help me? And I said, about what? Well, she said, I've had the strangest experience. I was teaching my fourth grade class in a St. Paul school and going along, talking about the reading assignment and so on, when suddenly the class was, as it were, blotted out. And I saw in front of my eyes, as it were, my husband pinned under an automobile, suffering at such and such avenue in Minneapolis, that foreign territory. She didn't add that. And she said the vision so startled me that I stopped my teaching. She said it was compulsive, it was compelling. And I went to the principal's office to see whether a call had come through, perchance for my husband, about an accident. But no call had come through, and the secretary to the principal said, why don't you go back and continue your teaching. So she went back and continued her teaching. Five minutes later, the secretary reappeared and told her in an excited tone that she had just had a call from a hospital in Minneapolis to which her husband had been admitted, that he'd had an automobile accident, had been pinned under the automobile at such and such an avenue in Minneapolis, as she had seen in her vision. And she continued, is this possible? Am I nuts? I was reminded of Dr. Brantner's uh, uh, problem in his talk. Am I nuts, she said, or do things like this occur? And so I had to try to assure her that the annals of psychical research are filled with case histories well vouched for of this character. The case histories occur. We do not know under what conditions as yet. We do not have adequate explanations. Now, had I expanded my comment to this lady, I would perhaps have given her my talk tonight, which as was true of ancient Gaul, is divided into three parts. First of all, what is the challenge of psychical research in our day? Secondly, what are some of the types of experiences that we often include under ESP and related phenomena? And here I'll have to be rather brief because our time is limited. Thirdly, what are the problems and what is the significance of psychical research? Now the challenge of psychical research, my first point, can be put in this way, it seems to me. On the one hand, our experiences of life often lead us to be gullible. We have certain frameworks which open the way, frameworks of thought which open the way to a too easy acceptance of the startling or the out of the ordinary. This is the tendency under some conditions in human beings to a kind of gullibility, to the acceptance at face value of every kind of experience without criticism or alleged experience. 
The gullible will often see things that are not there, as we put it, you see. On the other hand, an equally great tendency in our experience as human beings is to bring to life a framework so rigid that we exclude much of what is there. We won't look at it. Of course, all of our consciousness is selective, as William James used to put it. We never see everything in this room, for example. We pick and choose. And so it's very easy for those on this side of experience to cut out things that they don't wish to recognize. So that on the one hand, you find those who are subject to manipulation and fraud, the gullible, who see things that are not there, as it were. On the other hand, you have individuals who deny what is there conceivable. Now, this is the first challenge of psychical research. How do you walk a middle way between gullibility on the one hand and the exclusion of experience or the suppression of experience on the other hand. For example, most of our best cases, or many of our best cases, on alleged memories of previous incarnations come from India. And I'm often asked, doesn't this prove that it's simply imaginary, you know? No, it proves the contrary. Why don't you have many good cases of reincarnation in the United States, alleged memories of reincarnation, for example? You do have some, I hasten to add, and so many in India. Well, one explanation is, of course, that in India there is a prevalent belief that at least, this is the minimum, it goes much further than that, that reincarnation is a possibility. And so if a three-year-old child in India comes to its mother and says, I remember when I was Gupta Singh in such and such province, and that I was married, and that I had three children, and so on, which is a typical case of remembering reincarnation, alleged reincarnation, you see, the mother will at least listen, you see because the culture opens the way, so to speak, to listening to what the child has to say. But if a three-year-old in this country says, well, I'd like to talk to my little playmate that I see here, Jim, before I come to dinner, what is your reaction? Or what is the typical American's reaction? Oh, nonsense, you don't have a playmate. You're imagining that. How do you know? that he doesn't have a playmate. You see, this raises the whole question that Dr. Brantner put earlier of how do you distinguish between madness, on the one hand, let's say, and ecstasy, or genuine mystical religious experience, on the other hand. The problem can be illustrated in a dream of Carl Jung, for example. Carl Jung was not only interested in psychical phenomena, he had many psychic experiences. One night, Carl Jung had a dream that he was visiting a yogi who was sitting in a little hut by the side of a stream. And he came up to the yogi and shook hands and said, hello, yogi, and the yogi said, hello, Carl. Our words to this effect. And then suddenly, in the middle of his dream, Carl Jung tells us, a question was raised in his mind. Was I meditating the yogi, or was the yogi meditating me, you see? Now, modern psychical research arose out of questions of this kind. More specifically, it arose out of an undergraduate society at Cambridge University in the latter half of the 19th century. 
Many things that are good come from undergraduates, I want to remind you. This society had heard reports of ghosts in and about Cambridge University, and they decided to investigate them. So they organized the Ghost Society. And later on, the Ghost Society was to be the model, in a sense, or the beginning, or the initiating factor in the establishment of the British Society for Psychical Research in 1882. It initially sprang from the Darwinian thesis indirectly, because many religionists believed that Darwin and Darwinian belief were incompatible with belief in the survival of the human soul after bodily death. And so the motivation originally in modern psychical research was in part the effort to provide a scientific foundation, if possible for the belief in survival. This was a motivation, although the methods were very careful recording and sifting of experience. And later on, of course, after the 30s with Dr. Ryan at Duke, particularly, to conduct controlled experiments in the whole area of psychic phenomena. But always, you see, keeping in mind very carefully the peril of gullibility on the one hand or on the other of excluding experience which actually is there. And so the great challenge, I suppose you could say, of modern psychical research is to provide a body of systematic knowledge or to suggest a body of systematic knowledge which will enable us, or systematically organize knowledge, which will enable us to develop theories about that knowledge, or those data, as we might put it, in relationship to human personality and its environment. Now, in order to show uh, the range of psychical phenomena, I should like in my second point to suggest the range all the way from what we might call the problem of inspiration in human beings to the problem of survival on the other end. And the intermediate stages I'll simply try to indicate in terms of examples where possible. We start over then on this side, and for many years, human beings have been puzzled about the phenomenon of inspiration. Rosamond Harding has written a, a little book, a little volume entitled The Anatomy of Inspiration, in which she analyzes the experiences of poets and scientists and novelists and those who supposedly are inspired and almost unanimously, these persons record their creative experience or their inspiration in words something like this. It was as if not I were doing the writing, but as if my hand were told what to write. Or as Sir Francis Galton put it, for example, in his biography, that solutions to a problem of scientific theory, as he put it, suddenly came like a flash. He didn't imply that you didn't have to study, but he did imply that the putting together of the parts, so to speak, or the relating of the whole to the parts, seemed to come as if in a flash from beyond himself. I think it's very interesting then that whether you're a poet are a scientist, or as some of my friends said, whether you're merely a poet or a scientist. Why we should get the idea that poets, for example, somehow are soft and unreliable and scientists reliable, I don't know. But at any rate, we do. Whether you are a poet or a scientist, something like this seems to happen. 
Let me record another example from a scientist who was an, a seriologist and who was puzzled about how to put ancient inscriptions together, stones that had been broken apart, you see, and how to fit them together. He was ready to publish a book, and it was in proof already. But there was one puzzle which he hadn't solved about how to put two pieces of writing together that he had discovered in Nineveh, in the ruins of Nineveh. And one night he had a dream. And in the dream, an ancient Assyrian priest appeared before his consciousness. I suppose you can call it his consciousness, his altered consciousness. And the Egyptian, or the, the Assyrian priest said to him, it's obvious what you should do about this inscription, these two parts, or the, this incompleted part. He said, I'll take you down this corridor in his dream to this other temple and show you the missing part which you have in your own collection but which you didn't even recognize. So in his dream, the scientist was escorted by the ancient priest and in the temple, down at the end of the corridor, the solution was found. He woke up in the morning, he remembered the words of the priest, he found the way to decipher the inscription by putting the parts together and he finished his book, you see. Now, there are all sorts of explanations that one could offer for this kind of an experience, but you see, what you have here is a solution coming to you, a scientist, from the perspective of what we would call an altered state of consciousness. As we move over a little bit in our spectrum, Almost all of us, I suppose, have had the experience of what is called a deja vu. I've been here before. Again, we don't know how to account for it. Uh, perhaps in some cases, very easy to account for it. We're mistaken. We haven't been there before. And uh, we're the prey of illusion or something of this sort. But how do we know, you see, that we haven't been there before? The question is often raised. And so I want to point out in just a moment, there's, there, there are so many startling experiences that are well vouched for in the data that we have to end up almost every point on the spectrum with a question and not an answer. Moving over a little bit further, of course, we have the phenomena associated with religious mysticism, as Dr. Brantner has put it already. I don't need to tarry at this point except to enter an objection to the loose use of this word mysticism. The word mysticism, strictly speaking, means the claim of some souls that they can unite themselves with the divine directly. Unfortunately, mysticism is used in so many different contexts that it has been a corrupted word. And I hope we can preserve its purity in a sense. The greatest work, in my judgment, on modern mysticism is that by Evelyn Underhill, called Mysticism, an abbreviated edition of which is Elements of Mysticism, which you can obtain in paperback. At any rate, it is akin to the kinds of experiences that we associate with parapsychology are the paranormal, not the, quote, supernatural, as over against the natural, you see. This illustrates one of the problems of language that I think Dr. Brantner referred to. Uh, modern investigators do not use the term supernatural or natural. They use the term paranormal, conceivably, it's not a usual sort of thing to see a ghost, for example, coming down uh, up the steps here, but it occurs. It's out of our normal experience, you see. This is why we call it paranormal. Well, as we move further then from religious mysticism, we come to three areas which are very well documented, it seems to me, both in anecdotal experience and in experimental 
controlled experimental work. I refer, of course, to clairvoyance, telepathy, and precognition. Clairvoyance, the capacity of some at least, and perhaps all of us under certain conditions, to see things at a distance without the intermediation of sense. Take, for example, uh, an instance from the life of Peter Herkos, the Dutch clairvoyant. He helped a lady solve a problem, and she came to him then and said, well, now what do I owe you, having her purse with her? And he said, nothing, madam. You don't owe me anything. But he said, I would like that chocolate in your purse nestled under that $5 bill on the left-hand side, you see. Now, she didn't even know the chocolate was there. She opened her purse and searched around. You know how women search their purses, for example. This is a typical experience. And she found a tiny chocolate nestled under a $5 bill in her purse. This is an example of what we would usually call a clairvoyant experience. Presumably she was not sending the message to him. She didn't know about it. He saw it directly, you see. Now in a telepathic experience, and telepathy was a word coined by one of the great pioneers in psychical research, F.W.H. Myers, whose book Human Survive, uh, Human Personality and Its Survival of Bodily Death is well worth reading. You can get it from University Books at New Hyde Park, New York, and I'm not its agent, of course, but I, I want to give you that address. F.W.H. Myers coined the term telepathy to signify the capacity, apparently, of far feeling as the expression is. That is to say, if I know something and try to send the message to you, uh, and you receive it, whatever the explanation, this would be a telepathic experience. Uh, once when I sat with a medium, for example, in London, she purported to give me some messages from my relatives, very accurate, who had passed beyond. But you see, one reason I tried to avoid gullibility at this point was because she could have gained this information telepathically by reading my supraconscious or the subconscious, whatever explanation you uh, have for a situation of that kind. It need not have been a message from relatives who survived. I might have had in my supraconscious or subconscious knowledge of these relatives, which she then was able to comprehend. And sometimes when I talk with my friends and, and relate them stories, for example, from Bishop Pike in his book, The Other Side, they will say slyly to me, well, that must have been merely telepathy. And I often think how much progress we've made in the last 60 years when individuals of that type cannot explain it except telepathically, you see. Because perhaps 60 years ago, they wouldn't even have looked at the evidence. Then there is the, the experience we call precognitive experience, non-inferential precognition, that is, a foreseeing or the foretelling of the future without having any basis for projection from a given experience now. The scientist, in a sense, predicts. He says, if you put H2O together, you'll get water in the future. You see. But you see, that's an inferential prediction, a non-inferential prediction. This is going to happen. For example, the Aberystwyth mine disaster at Wales, in Wales several years ago, you remember where so many children were killed by the falling end of the mountain. Many people had precognitive dreams of that, including many of the details, uh, how big the mountain was, how many children, where the school was located, and so on, detail after detail, months before the accident happened. You see, now, how do you account for experiences of this kind? 
In the experimental area, some of our best work has been done by the mathematician S.G. Soul in Great Britain. And he had two very good subjects, one who sent the message and the other who received it. And the person who received it, using ESP cards, similar to those used by Ryan, I brought a pack along, for example, ESP cards. He used cards similar to that. And he found that the percipient, the person who guessed the cards, was not guessing the card sent, the message sent, but the one before the message was sent. In other words, he was anticipating what the agent would send consistently, more or less consistently, to such a great degree, as a matter of fact, that the odds against it being chance were a billion, billion, billion against one. And so, furthermore, conducted these experiments at a distance. He conducted them, for example, between this room and the next. And the odds against chance were equally great. He conducted them across the English Channel. The odds against chance were equally great. The scores were as hives, from which he inferred that distance made no difference in ESP. In normal sense experience, I suppose you could say my voice, even with the help of this, would fade after a certain point, at least as it were, so to speak, I think it would, uh, if, if I know what sense is all about. But in ESP experiments, rather consistently, distance seems to make no difference. I'll come back to that point in my third and last point when I talk about the significance of ESP. But let's move on now from precognitive types of experience to out-of-the-body experiences. We're getting hotter and hotter at this point, so to speak, and perhaps experiences which many of you would deny, even if they're vouched for. And in an out-of-the-body experience, a typical situation runs something like this that I am lying on my bed and I have the experience that I have risen to the top of the ceiling, to the top of the, uh, of the room, and I am looking down on my body. I leave the room going through a door that is closed, let's say, and uh, let's say go up to Duluth, have a conference with the mayor, converse with him, or at least observe him, maybe not converse with him, uh, during the course of the day, and then I feel myself being drawn back to my body. And I wake up and I check it out, and sure enough, the mayor was doing exactly what I saw him doing when allegedly I went to Duluth, you see, while my body was in Minneapolis. Let me illustrate from a recent case history, because I suppose this is one of the areas about which you will be most incredible. Credulous, rather. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Sherman were living in an apartment in Hollywood, California. I keep the names in mind because they're important. A friend, Harry Luce, lived in Monterey, some 20 miles away. Luce was known as a man who often had psychic experiences. Returning to the apartment house at mid-afternoon on Thanksgiving Day, the Shermans were surprised to find a note marked 2.30 p.m. reading, Mr. Luce was here. We'll see you Sunday. The hotel clerk gave them the note, and the hotel clerk's name was Mr. Cousins. The Shermans visited the Luces regularly on Sundays and were all the more amazed that Mr. Luce, who was in poor physical condition, should have braved the holiday traffic to come across Los Angeles to see them without notice. At 3.30 p.m., Sherman phoned Luce to express regrets at having been out. The response was, Harold, there's been some mistake. You have me confused with someone else, surely. I didn't come to see you. 
I haven't been out of the house today. And then he proceeded to describe how he was sitting in his house in old trousers with a tan sweater and a green shirt and so on. The man at the desk, he said, Mr. Cousins, must have made a mistake. Sherman, greatly puzzled, replied, that's funny. I can't figure out how Mr. Cousins should have made such an error. In the first place, he's never met you because he doesn't work Sundays. The only day you ever come over here. I can't imagine how he'd get your name. Sherman talked to Cousins and found that the man he had seen was dressed in conformity with Luce's own description. Cousins said further, I looked up and saw him standing at the desk, not having noticed him come in. He gave me this message for you, speaking slowly and with great difficulty, as though he had false teeth and was having trouble keeping them in place. He spoke clearly, however, and wanted to know, after I had written down his message, if I had it correct. Cousins reported that afterwards a woman guest standing by said, he was a strange one, wasn't he? Cousins then looked to see if Luce was still there and might have heard her, but he was gone. It had been Cousins' thought that Luce might have, quote, rested on the sofa before leaving as he seemed to be out of breath and not natural. On the following Sunday, Luce told Sherman that he was greatly disturbed. He then said, Harold, I think the time has come to tell you a few things about myself that I was afraid you would not understand. For some years now, I've had the ability to leave my body and consciously to appear in spirit form at distant places on visits to certain individuals. During the time I am absent from my physical body, it remains in a deep state, a deep sleep state. To try to arouse me during those periods would be a great nervous shock. Luce went on to explain that these visits were prearranged and that afterwards he remembered what had happened. What perturbed him now, apparently, was that he was leaving his body without knowing it or remembering it. To abstain, obtain still better evidence on whether this had actually happened, it was planned that Mr. Luce should dress as he was on Thanksgiving Day, visit the apartment house, and confront Mr. Cousins to see if he would be recognized. Poor Mr. Cousins. He had a nervous moment or two, but Sherman, who was in the offing, quickly put in an appearance, explaining that this time Mr. Luce was in the flesh. Mr. Cousins gave a, gen a sigh of genuine relief. Well, he said, I'm glad to know that. I didn't know what to think this time. Luce asked if he was dressed as Cousins had seen him before. Cousins said he thought that the shirt was lighter colored than before. Luce said yes, the other one was in the wash. Now, if you, for example, read an autobiography like that of the late Yogananda, the autobiography of a yogi, it is full of experiences similar to this in which Yogananda participated. Of course, the yogi discipline, one aspect of it at least, claims to be able to train you, you see, to separate yourself from the body. Of course, that raises all sorts of interesting philosophical questions. What is the self that leaves the body? And what is the relationship between the self and the body? You see, I'll come back to that in my third point. Now, we move then from the out-of-the-body experiences to psychometry as a type of ESP experience. If I am a psychometrist and you bring me a handkerchief that belongs to your dead Aunt Nellie, for example, whom I've never met, I can feel this handkerchief, perhaps smell it, rub it, and describe your Aunt Nellie, where she was born conceivably, where she was educated, and so on, all by handling the handkerchief. This has happened on many occasions, for example, in the life of Peter Herkos, uh, in his attempts to solve many a crime. 
he almost always says, bring me something that belonged to the murdered person. Or, if you have it, something that belonged to the person who allegedly murdered him, you see. And then he proceeds retrocognitively. This is another term that we ought to use. Instead of precognitively, to recreate the situation from the book, let's say, that he's been given that belonged to the murdered, or whatever it happened to be. And so psychometry is a well-vouched-for phenomenon in this whole range of phenomena. Or again, we have phenomena connected with what modern ESP researchers call psychokinesis, the capacity for the mind or the psyche to influence the way physical objects fall, let's say, or the capacity apparently to have a physical object move from that desk over there to the other side of the room and fall on your head, which would be an example of what we usually call a poltergeist, a mischievous spirit, as the German would have it, you see. Now, Rhein has conducted many experiments with the alleged psychokinetic capacity. You'll find them related in great detail in the recent book by Louisa Rhein called Mind Over Matter. And this is a volume well worth reading if you're interested in controlled experimentation in this area. The thrust of the conclusions is, of course, that this capacity does indeed exist. As a matter of fact, Ryan began investigating this capacity uh, when some professional gamblers told him, well, now, J.B., I can influence the way dice fall. He didn't believe it. Well, I can, they said. And so he began his experiments, you see, over 30 years ago. And sure enough, they were right that you can influence, apparently, under some circumstances. Now, we don't know the exact circumstances, the exact conditions, the way material objects will fall. Similarly, in the whole series of uh, healing phenomena, there is an increasing interest. Of course, for many, many years, uh, we've heard of persons who allegedly had healing hands, for example. But of course, uh, here again, we might be too gullible. We might accept at face value the claims, or we much, might shut out certain aspects of the experience. Uh, take, for example, however, a recent controlled experiment with healing. Uh, I'm not giving you what it means. I'm simply relating it. And it appeared in one of the journals uh, devoted to psychical research. Fifteen mice were scratched on the back till the blood came. Another 15 were scratched on the back till the blood came. The first group was subjected to the healing hands of a person who allegedly had the capacity to heal physical wounds. He put his hand on the mice and, as it were, blessed them. The other group, the control group, was not subject to the so-called healing hands. The scars healed much more rapidly in the first group than in the second. Now, again, you can have all sorts of criticisms, you see, about the controlled experiment, but here it was. Related to this whole phenomenon of healing is the problem of the relationship of the psyche to plants. And there's been an increasing interest among parapsychologists in this area, for example. Perhaps most of you have read of the experiments in Canada, which seem to indicate, as it were, that corn will grow much faster if you play a Beethoven sonata nearby, you see, or some piece of music. Uh, one of the great modern botanists has done classical work with the tomato plant, for example, the sensitivity of the tomato. And there's increasing evidence that the old theory of a green thumb that is, that one psychic attitude to the plant, one psychic attitude to the plant will affect its growth. 
Recently, there was another experiment with barley, the growth of barley. Here, the man with healing hands, alleged healing hands, whatever that means, but this was his reputation, held some barley seed. Then it was planted in, in the ground. Another uh, bunch of barley seed was planted in the ground with no benefit of the laying on of hands, as it were. The same type of soil, same type of watering, and so on. All the other conditions were presumably identical. The first batch of barley grew much faster and much taller than the second batch. Now, we come to the, uh, perhaps the more controversial aspects of this subject when we get into the area of alleged communication with the alleged dead. Uh, there are various ways through which you can, uh, you can approach this subject, and obviously I can't deal with it in the next six minutes, which is all the time I'm going to take. Uh, but let me suggest some ways in which the, pro the problem has been approached in the annals of modern psychical research. If you'd like further discussion of this problem by a very eminent social scientist, one of the few social scientists interested in parapsychology, unfortunately, I recommend the volume by Harnell Hart, H-A-R-T, Harnell, H-O-R-N-E-L-L, Harnell Hart, called The Enigma of Survival. There he will deal with the evidence pro and con and the arguments pro and con. But among the ways in which presumably uh, we have attempted to communicate with the alleged dead would be automatic writing. The medium, the medium is simply a hypersensitive person to the ESP area. And uh, a classical example, the cross correspondences which went on for 30 years and in which people who were dead communicated with six different mediums throughout the world. And the snatches of communication that came through them were then put together and made sense. You see, individually they didn't make sense. Some of the mediums, for example, uh, recorded messages in Latin. They didn't know any Latin, but the messages had come from Latin scholars who had died, for example. This communication went on for a period of from between about 1908 to 1938, you see. I referred earlier to my experience with the medium in London. Uh, she told my wife, for example, that uh, her brother-in-law had recently died of cancer, left a small family and wanted to be remembered to her, and then proceeded to give the brother-in-law's name. Uh, all this had happened. We had gone to the medium under an assumed name. I'd given a Greek name. I don't know why I picked out Greek. I called myself, I think, Mr. Theopopoulos. Uh, but again, you see, this is no conclusive proof because she may have gained this information telepathically. But I'll defy you, you see, to give me another hypothesis in a situation like that. Some of you have read the late Bishop, Bishop Pikes the other side. And you remember the incident there where his son died and he was cremated and the ashes were scattered over the Golden Gate. And then Bishop Pike went back to London and resumed his work and then had a sitting with the medium Mrs. Ena Twig. And soon his son came through, allegedly, and said, thank you for the beautiful funeral that you gave me, I can think of nothing nicer than to have my ashes scattered over the Golden Gate. All this through Mrs. Twig, you see. Uh, again, we don't know what the answer is, and I, and I wish I had time to develop this theme much more fully. The late C.J. Ducasse, who is one of America's well-known philosophers, devoted a whole volume to this problem. I mention these names not to drop names, but to call your attention to the fact that some of the most eminent minds of the 20th century have been concerned with the problems we're dealing with in this brief talk. You see. 
that they're not nuts by usual standards. I don't know what Dr. Brantner would say about them, but uh, by usual standards, they're not nuts, you see. Now, finally, let me touch in my second point on the question of reincarnation. This has become the leading research interest now of Dr. Eon Stevenson, who is professor of neurology at the University of Virginia Medical School. And his recent book called 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation is a report of alleged memories of incarnation, reincarnation throughout the world, uh, including Brazil, the United States, the Eskimos, Indians, and so on, uh, and very carefully studied cases. Of course, almost all the great poets have had a belief in the notion of reincarnation. You remember Wordsworth's lines, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting, the soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath that elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. And recent letters of Wordsworth indicate that he had a very profound commitment to the notion of reincarnation. But as far as I know, our era is the first era in which these alleged memories of reincarnation previous lives, uh, are being subjected to systematic study, you see. And Dr. Stevenson is attempting to check them out against other records, you see, to see the degree to which they uh, are indeed veridical, is the term. On the whole question of apparitions, of course, which is related to the problem of survival, let me say this, as a certain eminent politician puts it. Uh, that apparitions exist, you cannot question if you look at the record, I think. I can't prove it here now, but I invite you to do so. I invite you particularly to read the little volume by G.N.M. Tyrell, T-Y-R-R-E-L-L, -L, called Apparitions. Uh, a typical apparition is a deathbed apparition, a crisis apparition, you see. You're lying on your bed, you're, uh, suddenly you wake up at 1 a.m. and your dear friend, Jane, appears before you, uh, dressed in her ordinary dress and talking, and she says, goodbye, I've just died, farewell, and disappears. Now, this is a very common kind relatively, of apparition. Tyrell's theory is that something like this is involved, that on my, and the next day, of course, I get word that she died precisely at that point, that something like this is involved, that when she was lying on her deathbed, she wanted to see me very much, and that just as a telephoto machine in New York breaks down the photo into dots and transmits them to Minneapolis, which then can reconstruct the dots into a photograph. So the human personality, under certain circumstances, has the power to break down the image of the person, so to speak, the psychic image of the person, into dots to transmit them, and that the person at the other end has the capacity to reconstruct them into an auditory and visual image, you see, uh, which is his explanation of at least of some types of apparitions. There have been experimentations with ghosts. One famous ghost case, for example, the ghost was observed to walk up and down the stairs at precisely 5 p.m. every evening. And the question was raised, was it physical? Was it a physical phenomenon? So the experiment was to draw a string across the staircase, you see, a stout string, to see if the ghost would trip on the string. No, it didn't. It went right through it up the stairway, which seemed to show that apparitions at least are not physical. They're psychical phenomena of some sort. But what, you see? Which brings us then to my third point on which I'd like to dwell for precisely two and a half minutes. The first great problem of psychical research is, of course, what I have suggested throughout, to discover the conditions under which these phenomena 
exist and perhaps can be duplicated, you see. And about this we know very little. If we ever know how to communicate without sensory impressions, this will have an enormous impact for the idea of community, of course, if you can communicate without language, let's say. If we know the conditions under which this can happen. I'm writing a utopian novel just now, and one of the characteristics of this my ideal society is that people have discovered the conditions under which they can communicate without the use of words. Uh, think what this would mean implicitly, of course, for community and for human personality. We need to discover explanations, you see. As Professor Johnsrud of your faculty remarked to me just this evening, psychical research is long on data but short on theory, which is exactly true. There are plenty of vouched for data, but we don't have adequate theoretical explanations. You see. That's where we have to move. Of course, psychical research raises the vexing problem of space and time, too, which is exactly the problem that theoretical physicists have been concerned with, particularly since Einstein. And it's always interesting to me that of all the scientists that I know of, the theoretical physicists are most open to psychical research. Um, and for a very good reason, because they're, what is space? If distance makes no difference, let's say, in communication through ESP, what is time? What, what becomes of our notions of past, present, and future? Uh, if Precognitive experience is real. Our retrocognitive experience see, is real. Of course, what is reality, as Jung would put it as well. So this vexing problem of space and time, which is an ancient problem. Another problem that is posed by psychical research is the whole question of the relationship between the psyche and the body. You see, the ancient mind-body problem. Don't let anyone tell you that that issue is solved. It isn't, you see. But psychical research gives it a new dimension. And lastly, of course, and I think most interestingly, psychical research raises anew, and in a different context, the whole question of what is a human being, you see. What is a human being? Immanuel Kant used to say, that two things filled him with utter awe, you will remember. The starry heavens above and the moral law within. If we may take liberties with the latter, this is what psychical research is about. And I suspect that the most startling discoveries in our coming generation will not be the result of space exploration, but the result of the study of paranormal capacities of human beings, for example, which we have not taken, not taken seriously enough in the past. Uh, at this point, <laughs> at this point, I, I am reminded, obviously, of <laughs> I am reminded in talking about human personality, I'm reminded of Shakespeare's words again. There are more things in heaven and earth. Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. I assure you, no one consciously turned off the microphone. Uh.